Okay, so Donald Trump's grand jury is back in session on Thursday. We're going to bring you all the kind of shocking and breaking news from that particular area momentarily. First, the, the kind of most important story of the day, and we tend to cover a lot of what's happening like right in the news, right this second. We're going to do a lot of that in just one second because there is a lot of stuff happening today. But the kind of broader trend lines in American society are the things that that ripple under the surface and they tend to have the biggest impact. So there is a, a big story that has been kind of buried because, again, in, in news, we tend to follow the urgent rather than the necessary. And this story should be somewhat troubling to everyone. The story is that IQ scores in the United States are actually beginning to drop. Now, the United States is not unique in this respect. You've seen IQ scores in a lot of westernized countries increase gradually over the course of the last century and then kind of stagnate and then finally start to drop a little. Actually, you've seen this in places like Norway as early as 2018. But now for the first time, this is happening in the United States. According to Northwestern, IQ scores have substantially increased from 1932 through the 20th century with differences ranging from three to five IQ points per decade, according to a phenomenon known as the Flynn effect. The Flynn effect is the gradual increase in IQ over time. And there are a lot of explanations for why that happened. Maybe it's nutrition, maybe it's education, right? As we become a richer, better educated society, people overall tend to have higher IQs, although at the very top end of the spectrum, people who have high IQs basically have kind of the same IQs they've, they've always had. But there's a new study from Northwestern and it's found evidence of a reverse Flynn effect in a large US sample between 2006 and 2018 in every category except for one. For the reverse Flynn effect, there are consistent negative slopes for three out of four cognitive domains. So what this means is that ability scores for verbal reasoning, that'd be logic and vocabulary, matrix reasoning, which would be visual problem solving, and analogies, letter and number series, that'd be computational and mathematical, dropped during the study period. The only area in which the IQs apparently got better is scores of 3D rotation, spatial reasoning, which would suggest that people are spending an awful lot of time on their cell phones. Composite ability scores, which are sort of like your overall IQ scores, are also lower for more recent samples, and the differences in scores are present regardless of age, education, or gender. So something is happening in American society, and it is actually driving the IQ scores down. Now, there are a bunch of theories as to why that is happening. None of them are particularly encouraging because they're all systemic. So the first one is the idea that education itself is beginning to fail, that you have over the course of the last century, and again, true in all westernized countries, as more people get educated, as more people go to school, as more people go to high school and then to college, Overall, IQ scores tend to rise that as there are educational effects, IQ scores, particularly at the lower end of the spectrum where people are undereducated, tend to rise. So, for example, right now, Ashkenazic Jewish IQs are famously higher than average. But in the early 20th century, Ashkenazic Jewish IQs were actually lower than average because many of the people who were coming over from Europe were not actually educated. They were, they were fifth grade graduates and they spoke Yiddish. And then over time, as they grew more, more educated, the IQ scores started to go up because the tests only measure what the tests measure. That's happened with entire populations. As the populations grow more educated, and as you focus in on a meritocracy, you're essentially incentivizing better IQ performance. So it's possible that education has now petered out. And you can see this in higher education, where we have stopped focusing on exactly the sorts of skills that you would need in order to, in order to score high on IQ. We've stopped focusing on how verbally dexterous you are. We, we've stopped focusing in on your ability to use reason mathematical computation, all that has gone completely by the wayside in education in favor of other priorities, like the, the sort of victimhood mentality and how well you can play the system. So when it comes to our, our IQ for playing the system, our IQ for playing the system, our incentive structures have totally changed in education over the course of the last 20 years. That certainly cannot be helping. Then there's the problem of demographics. When I talk about demographics, I'm not talking about racial demographics here. I'm talking about the simple fact that over time, higher IQ people tend to earn more money. People who earn more money tend to have fewer children. People who earn less money tend to have more children. And so what that means is that if you are having fewer people at the top of the IQ spectrum, and IQ is largely genetic, if you start to see people at the top of the IQ spectrum having fewer kids and people at the bottom of the IQ spectrum having, having more kids, then you end up with, with the sort of prophecy of idiocracy in which the people with the lower IQ tend to predominate. Now, again, that's changed over time because people who are low income earning over time when there was discrimination, that didn't correlate with IQ. A lot of people who didn't earn a high income 50 years ago, it's because the system actively was discriminating against them or because they were brand new immigrants, they'd not been assimilated. But as we are a very assimilative society, and as all of the restrictions have gone away on particular ethnic groups, for example, in the United States, what you're starting to see is the possibility of IQ breakdown. You've seen this happen again, not just in the United States, but also in Europe. So the demographic crisis that is about to break on Western shores, namely people not having enough kids, is going to have particularly market effect when it turns out that many of the people who are really not having kids are the people who are also the most likely to be at the top end of the IQ spectrum. Again, because income earning and IQ tend to have a very high overlap in free societies. 
Okay, and then there's the final theory here, which is that we are all addicted to our smartphones. We are all addicted to our computers. ChatGPT is going to make us dumber. That our reliance on machines makes us stupider. All of which suggests that America has a rough ride in store for it, and so does the rest of the West. Because the notion of continual progress relies, again, on continual human betterment. And that, in turn, relies on a set of incentives that actually is going to incentivize people to make good decisions and to create a better society. When all those incentive structures and all of those categories go away, you end up with a real problem on your hands. We'll talk about that in just one second. First, let's talk about the predations of big tech. So we'll get to more on big tech actually preying on your mind in just one second. But the fact of the matter is, big tech also monetizes you. Big tech is there to ensure that you are taken advantage of in terms of your data. You think you're getting this stuff for free, you're not. They're taking all your data, they're wrapping it up, they're selling it, they're giving it to the government, they're doing all sorts of stuff with your data. This is why I have a VPN, it's why you should have a VPN. You should have ExpressVPN because it's the best VPN on the market. ExpressVPN is an app that anonymizes your online presence, making it much more difficult for big tech companies to track and sell your data. ExpressVPN also encrypts 100% of your network's data to protect you from cyber criminals. I use ExpressVPN on all my devices, phones, laptops, even Wi-Fi routers. It's incredibly easy to use. You just fire up the app and you click one button. If, like me, you believe your online activity is no one's business but your own, get the VPN I trust at expressvpn.com slash Ben. Use my exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash Ben. Get an extra three months for free. Expressvpn.com slash Ben. This is the best way to protect your internet data. I use it. You should use it as well. Expressvpn.com slash Ben. Get three months for free. Okay, so let's talk about some of those individual factors. So when it comes to the use of technology, we are deliberately making ourselves and our kids stupider through our use of technology. Our attention spans have now been reduced to essentially pea-sized attention spans. You, you literally cannot watch a YouTube show that does not cut every five seconds. And when you are watching, YouTube has essentially become a substitute for TV. So even sort of watching things for long periods of time, very, very difficult for people. If you look at the average amount of time that is spent on, say, Netflix or YouTube or TikTok, you can see that people like on an average day are spending two, three hours a day on these services. Are, are, is that going to generate any sort of any sort of serious skill set? Is that going to raise your IQ? Are people being made smarter by these apps? The answer obviously is going to be no. Americans are currently spending, according to Statista from 2020 to 2024, Americans are spending something like 45 minutes a day on TikTok and 45 minutes a day on YouTube, and they're spending over 60 minutes a day on Netflix. Okay, and that doesn't include all the other apps that people are spending their time on, you know, scrolling through Twitter or scrolling through Facebook. We are playing games with our brains that we just don't understand. And, you know, again, as somebody who tends to be sort of a, a technological optimist, I will say that hooking your brain into a machine that allows it to do all the work for you is going to make you dumber. The, the fact is that if you ask kids today to do sort of basic mathematical calculations, very few of them can do it. And one of the reasons that that is the case is because all you have to do is pull out your cell phone and the, the phone will do all the work for you. Now, does that excess brain power go toward growing in another area? Probably not. It probably just withers. You have to practice these skills in order to be smarter. So there's no question that all this stuff is making us stupider. By the way, you know who knows this is China, which is one of the reasons why China re actually puts out a different version of TikTok in the United States than it puts out in China. The version of TikTok in, in China actually teaches kids math. The version of TikTok in the United States teaches kids to be trans. In fact, yesterday it came out that there was a TikTok employee named Bruce Sapp. He's a content manager admitting that this algorithm is actually very good for China, the one that's been distributed in the United States. Uh, there's a lot of shit I don't agree with that happens, but... Like what? Thank you. There's a lot of... Um... I'm trying to think of like the, the most legal way to say it. Not that I don't trust you, but in case it does come back out. Okay, uh, you can be open with me. Like people in our government want to ban TikTok off of government officials' devices. Right. Why is that? If I had to guess, it's because I'm sure a lot of the coding is still very beneficial to China. And because of the whole China-America relationship, I'm sure it's something to do with that. TikTok, by the way, is now meeting on the Hill with a bunch of members of Congress. They're attempting to lobby the Biden administration. 
The United States right now is threatening to ban TikTok. The TikTok CEO is testifying before Congress for the very first time today. According to CNN, U.S. lawmakers are set to grill TikTok's chief executive on Thursday in a wide-ranging hearing that could not come at a more consequential moment for the embattled social media platform. TikTok CEO Xiao Chu will face the House Energy and Commerce Committee during his first appearance before Congress. That hearing kicks off at 10 a.m. Eastern. Chu is from Singapore. He'll testify on TikTok's customer consumer privacy and data security practices. The, the platform's impact on kids is the biggest one. TikTok supposedly has restrictions on the amount of time that kids can spend on TikTok, but with a couple of clicks, kids can move right on past that. And, you know, the reality is that because the eyeballs are on TikTok, everybody is on TikTok. The incentive structures are not stacked up in favor of the American consumer. I mean, it's why even members of the government who theoretically should be talking about banning TikTok are still using TikTok. In fact, yesterday, John Kirby, who's the national security spokesperson for the Biden administration, he was asked about the fact that right now there are serious considerations as to whether TikTok is a national security threat and Joe Biden continues to use it. I wanted to follow up on TikTok. Obviously, you've expressed again today the national security concerns uh, with the app. Why then did the president agree to appear in TikTok videos as recently as, I think, St. Patrick's Day? Again, we, uh, we have not changed our national security concerns uh, about the app. Uh, it's, it's, not, uh, on, uh, it's not for use on, uh, on government uh, devices, and uh, I don't have anything more for but you on that. does it send the wrong message if the administration is weighing a ban or could in the future have to weigh it? We have been very consistent about our concerns over TikTok. There's a CFIUS review underway. I, I know you want me to tell, tell you more about this, but I'm just not going to get ahead of that. So, you know, great. I mean, our government is obviously not doing its job in order to protect American citizens. Now, again, if you are a business, like we here at Daily Wire, we put stuff on TikTok specifically because that is where the eyeballs are. So you either abandon the platform entirely to the world's worst actors or you try to get on there. But this is why the government actually should be stepping in with regard to TikTok. The problem is that if you're a politician, the way that you're cool with the kids is by basically incentivizing them to continue using mental crack, which is why you have Representative Jamal Bowman of New York saying that the reason the Republicans want to ban TikTok is because they, quote unquote, ain't got no swag. You know, Robert, I just realized something. Republicans ain't got no swag. That's why they want to ban, ban TikTok. <laughs> Republicans ain't got no swag. That's the problem. Oh, is that the problem? Is that they ain't got no swag? Genius level stuff from our elected Congress people. So one of the factors in the decline of the American IQ certainly is the addiction to social media. Another one of those factors is the educational system, which is geared toward, again, paying off particular constituencies. It is not geared at educating our children. We'll get to that in a moment. First, let's talk about the fact that you're spending too much money on the big phone companies. I'm talking Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile. Instead, you should be getting a brand new iPhone 12 from Pure Talk for just $12 a month. With Pure Talk's $30 plan, there's no contract, no interest. You can cancel or leave at any time. Get a new iPhone 5G service, cut your cell phone bill in half with Pure Talk. I'm a Pure Talk customer. You should be as well. Switch right now in as little as 10 minutes at puretalk.com. Enter promo code Shapiro. Save 50% off your first month of coverage. Choose from a variety of unlimited talk and text plans with plenty of high-speed data, all backed by 100% money-back guarantee. Pure Talk saves the average family over $900 a year. There's no contract, no hidden fees, and no hassle. Head on over to puretalk.com. Enter promo code Shapiro. Save 50% off your very first month. And get an iPhone 12 for just 12 bucks a month. That's puretalk.com. Promo code Shapiro. Don't spend your money on the big guys when you really don't have to. The fact is, the Pure Talk's coverage is excellent. I've done all my business calls with Pure Talk for a while now, and I can tell you they're great. They have the same cell network as one of the big guys. Pure Talk is the smartest wireless on the market. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Go to puretalk.com. Enter promo code Shapiro. Save 50% off your very first month and get an iPhone 12 for just 12 bucks a month. All righty, so the, the failure to properly treat and control social media is a huge one. This is particularly true for kids. Kids' brains are still forming. And you can see that the, the people who develop the apps, they're really good at this, right? My, my three-year-old can control YouTube. They, they, they are developed for ease of use. And that also means addictiveness. And that does actually have an impact on the formation of kids' brains. So we are playing games with kids' brains that we really should not be playing with kids' brains, which is why my kids are not going to have internet access for a very long time. It's also why they're not allowed to watch TV. And if you want your kids' brains to develop properly, then you should be cutting them off from a lot of the social media upon which they've become reliant. Meanwhile, you have an educational system, particularly the public school educational system, which is not geared toward the interests of your children. It's a major, major issue. Perfect example. So right now, LAUSD, which is where I went to junior high. I went to junior high at Walter Reed Middle School in LAUSD. LAUSD is the second biggest school district in America. It is also a giant failure, LAUSD. It is a big bag of union-based failure. And now you have the SEIU that has shut down the schooling in LAUSD for two, three days. And they're doing so because they are striking and they are dancing in the rain in order to demonstrate how righteous their cause are. Here's some tape of the SEIU local dancing. 
Well, I'm so glad that they're out there dancing in the rain. Just very, very important stuff. They're not teaching the kids, but they are out there dancing. Exciting, exciting stuff. Well, the biggest problem is that um, LAUSD is a gigantic failure. If you look at every performance metric placed for LAUSD, they fail along pretty much every single performance metric. They've been failing for literally years. And that is not because of a failure to spend money. The fact is that LAUSD spends approximately $24,000 per student. $24,000 per student. Now, if you send your kid to a pretty good private school, it's going to cost you less than $24,000 per, per student. That is a more than $8,000 increase over the last five years. That's at the same time that LAUSD enrollment has declined 8% in the past two years. And the district has lost, get ready for this, 58% of all students since the 2000s. 50, this is according to the center square. 58% of its students have been lost since the 2000s. Okay, so they've lost over half their student population. They're charging $24,000 to taxpayers per student. And now they're striking. Now, why? Well, it turns out the janitors are in fact underpaid at LAUSD. But it's all being eaten up by administrative costs because you have a bunch of DEI and inclusion officials at these schools who are well overpaid. By the way, only 40% of LAUSD students are currently reading at grade level. Only 28.5% were on grade level in math. The, the reason, by the way, that, that so many families are leaving LAUSD is because people are not sending their kids to pre-K or kindergarten knowing that it's a giant waste of time. Instead, they are homeschooling or they are moving out of the city entirely. One of the reasons they're doing that is because the public schools kind of suck. Now, the, the public schools have not been doing their jobs for a very long time because, again, the public schools are directed at payoffs to public sector unions. They're not directed toward educating your children. Even what the union is striking for right now has very little to do with student services. It's about wages for various school custodians or cafeteria workers or bus drivers or other support staff. They stopped classes for more than a half million students in the nation's second largest school system in order to strike for all of this. By the way, you know what they've already been offered by the LAUSD school district? A 23% recurring pay increase plus 3% cash in hand bonus, a $20 an hour minimum wage, and full health care benefits for those working at least four hours a day. Those are the latest offers, and the SEIU is still out on strike. Does this sound like it's in the interest of students? It really, really does not. Karen Bass, who's the new mayor of Los Angeles, she opened up City Hall on Wednesday to host contract negotiations that had been stalled for weeks. And this will end, of course, with more concessions by taxpayer representatives to the unions. It's not going to end with the, with the LAUSD students actually getting better performance out of any of this. So the combination of deliberately making our kids dumber by hooking them into the mind poison that is the internet very often, the failures of our education system, which have been constructed on public school level in order to please public sector unions on the one hand, and then to indoctrinate them in foolish theories on the other is making our kids a lot dumber. And you combine that with the fact that we now have an entire society that is directing people not to have children. And what you end up with is overall a dumber society. Now, what is that going to mean for the future? Well, it's going to mean greater dependence on technology, but it also is going to mean less innovation in the technological space. It's going to mean that there, the, the, the progress that we have seen in terms of innovation is going to slow. If, if you sort of hit stasis point in terms of IQ, then what you end up with is, again, stasis in terms of innovation. If we're going to focus on the future, what we should be focusing on is increasing educational benefit for kids, which means presumably giving parents greater choice because competition in the marketplace is going to allow them to send their kids to better schools too. Really incentivizing parents to shut off the phone for their kids and get their kids out there in the real world, and performing mental tasks that, yes, a calculator could do, but that your brain should also be able to do. And finally, we should be incentivizing people of all stripes to actually be having children. And that means re-inculcating in them a sense that it is a communal responsibility for you to have kids. The radical individualism that is predominated in the West has had some salutary effects in terms of freeing people from the stringencies of the state economically. However, it's had some really negative effects in terms of liberating people from the sort of the, the, the social groups that originally created a, a culture of childbearing and child rearing in healthy ways. And we haven't even felt the beginning of the impacts of any of that yet. Okay, meanwhile, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, the grand jury has now been brought back on. It was called off on Wednesday for Donald Trump. We'll bring you the latest on the grand jury in just one second first. I like to think the people who watch this show are some of the people with the highest IQs, some of the people who are best and brightest in the nation. Well, if you're informed, you know that when a supply chain breaks down, when you got a real problem out there, 
you need to have the medicines that you that you need in your house. And sometimes you just can't get to the CVS or sometimes you can get to the CVS, but they don't actually have the medicine that you need. This is why you should have the Jace case from Jace Medical. It is the five most common antibiotics that you will, you will need in case of emergency. You have it in your house ready to go. Head on over to Jace Medical for that. But that's not all they're doing. My friends right now at Jace Medical are offering my audience a free ebook that every family needs in their emergency preparedness kit. The ebook is maybe a five minute read. I want you to download and save it so you have it when you need it. The guide provides valuable information regarding emergency wound care, proper first aid, and how to safely use antibiotics when necessary. Get this free ebook today at jacemedical.com forward slash Ben. That's J A S E medical.com forward slash Ben. Again, jacemedical.com forward slash Ben. Go check them out right now. Make your family medically safer. And by the way, in the process, get that ebook. It could be really useful in an emergency. jacemedical.com forward slash Ben. Alrighty, so the grand jury is, is going to come back and meet on Thursday. It is unclear exactly what's going to be happening behind those closed doors because. Again, it is a closed door situation. However, there is some bad news that appears to have emerged for the possible prosecution in this Trump indictment in Manhattan. Alvin Bragg, the Manhattan district attorney who's thinking about bringing this frivolous indictment, what appears to be a frivolous indictment, uh, he said that his office couldn't comment on grand jury matters. But on Wednesday, they were supposed to meet. They did not meet on Wednesday. And one of the crucial issues is that it appears that there was a resurfacing of a letter that Michael Cohen, who's the chief witness against Trump in this particular case, wrote in 2018, according to the UK Daily Mail. In that letter, Michael Cohen claimed that he was not reimbursed by Donald Trump or his organization for hush money payments to porn actress Stormy Daniels. That 2018 letter to the federal authorities contradicts his recent grand jury testimony, which is sworn testimony. The bombshell document was exclusively obtained by DailyMail.com and it could throw a wrench in the works for prosecutors pursuing criminal charges against Trump over the payments. Cohen claims that Trump got him to pay 130 grand to Daniels to keep her quiet about the alleged affair right before the 2016 election. And this is supposedly a campaign contribution that was essentially laundered. And he says Trump reimbursed him with personal funds and then later pled guilty to violating federal campaign finance law over the hush money. But now there's a letter from 2018. And that letter literally says that Michael Cohen did not actually get reimbursed by the Trump organization or the Trump campaign. Quote, neither the Trump organization nor the Trump campaign was a party to the transaction with Miss Clifford, that would be that would be Stormy Daniels. Neither it, neither reimbursed Mr. Cohen for the payment directly or indirectly. Contrary to the allegations in the complaint, which are entirely speculative, neither Mr. Cohen nor Essential Consultants LLC made any in-kind contributions to Donald J. Trump for president. Again, that letter was written in response to an FEC probe that was launched after complaints of campaign finance violation. So, you know, that is uh, that is in direct contradiction to the testimony that he is currently giving which may be the reason why the grand jury got canceled yesterday. It also may mean new witnesses in the grand jury. So we are awaiting sort of more information on the grand jury. But, you know, everything is sort of up in the air with regard to that. Meanwhile, again, there are other cases that are militating against Donald Trump in the legal system. Uh, apparently, the, a federal judge has now concluded that Trump likely misled his own lawyers on classified documents. According to the Wall Street Journal, a federal judge found that special counsel Jack Smith's team presented convincing evidence that Trump misled his own lawyers about the retention of classified documents after leaving the White House, which meant that he doesn't have attorney-client privilege. If you mislead your own attorney, then attorney-client privilege allows for the bypassing of it. Judge Beryl Howell made that finding Friday in a sealed decision siding with federal prosecutors in their bid to by bypass attorney-client privilege claims raised by one of Trump's lawyers to compel him to provide more testimony. So it is possible that classified documents case, which should be dead, given the fact that, again, Joe Biden had a bunch of classified documents sitting around his house, sitting around his offices. And these classified documents cases can now be brought up apparently against nearly every American public official. That case should be dead, but that one's not dead either. There are a lot of these issues that are just sort of like lurking out there. And here is the weird math that is now cropped up in this Republican primary 2024. Every time Trump is unjustly attacked, there's a rally around the Trump effect. And ever, all the Republicans come out of the woodwork and they say, we don't like that he is being specifically targeted, which, which is right. In, we're, we're talking about frivolous charges in pretty much all of these cases. The, the Democrats have been trying to, to say that he's dead to rights since literally 2016. And they've yet to get him. It, it, it's, it's all Scooby-Doo kind of stuff for them. Well, with that said, does that mean that that's going to somehow help him in general, right? Here's the, here's the weird math that's happening. The more Trump is in the headlines, the better he does in the Republican primaries and the worse he does in general election. So that's a real bad math for Republicans. Republicans are going to have to decide whether to use their head or their heart in the 2024 primary. Again, I understand the reaction 
to attacks on Trump. People saying, okay, we got to rally around Trump. They hate him so much. That's because he's, he's a threat to them. I get it. I also understand that the left is not fully stupid. And one of the things that they would like more than anything is to make sure that the person they think is most vulnerable is the guy who ends up as the Republican nominee, which is precisely why, presumably, you have people like former U.S. Representative David Jolly, who is a uh, who is a former Republican who is now part of the sort of Lincoln Project Club, promoting all of the all of the left wing attacks on Ron DeSantis and also promoting Trump's attacks on DeSantis. I, I mean, I'm noticing a wide variety of reporters who supposedly think that Donald Trump is Hitler resonating to his attacks on DeSantis because they would rather have Trump than DeSantis, not because they love Trump, but because they think Trump is more defeatable in 2024 than they think DeSantis is. Trump, for his part, is just attacking DeSantis endlessly. And I, this, this I find astonishing. Just if you are a Republican and you are sympathetic to Donald Trump and you're sympathetic to the fact that he is being attacked frivolously by a bunch of legal authorities who are overreaching their boundaries, then wouldn't you want Trump to fight back against them? Wouldn't you want Trump to be focusing all of his ire not on fellow Republican candidates, but on, say, Alvin Bragg? But that's not what Trump is doing. Trump is taking this opportunity to swivel the sympathy for him into an attack on his Republican opponents 2024, which does not suggest that he has the best interest of the Republican Party in mind or the best interest of, of the right in general in attacking the left on his mind. It suggests that everything is an opportunity for Donald Trump. And that if he has the opportunity to swivel and just club Ron DeSantis in the moment where he has a little bit of momentum, then he will, which is really kind of hideous because here is the thing. If the people who you think are the real danger to the American Republic are rogue prosecutors like Alvin Bragg going after Republicans for no reason other than they are Republicans and he wants to get his face on the cover of Time magazine, if that's the real threat, then why are you up for Donald Trump attacking fellow Republican candidates in the middle of that? His ire should be on the prosecutors, but that's not where he's spending his ire. He's spending his ire on Ron DeSantis. And again, this galaxy brain take started last week. As soon as Trump started talking about the indictment, there was an immediate call from Republican commentators who were very Trumpy saying, where's Ron DeSantis? Where's Ron DeSantis on this? It was very reminiscent of the Taylor Swift silence is deafening. What does Ron DeSantis have to do with any of this? If you're talking about a list of people responsible for Donald Trump's possible indictment in New York, the list goes something like this. Alvin Bragg, the rogue Manhattan DA, Stormy Daniels, Michael Cohen, Donald Trump for stripping everything in sight in 2006, apparently. Is Ron DeSantis even on that list? And yet Ron DeSantis is somehow at the center of the indictment story. The only reason is because Donald Trump decided to drag him into the center of that indictment story in order to attack him, which does not speak particularly well of the former president of the United States or, or, or his intentions with regard to the campaign. And you see that breaking out into public yesterday. So Ron DeSantis decided not again to attack Alvin Bragg, the guy who is trying to put him in jail. That is not where he's actually placing his ire. Instead, he's putting out statements like this, quote, now that Ron DeSanctimonious is finally admitting he's in the race by beginning to fight back, and now that his polls have crashed, so he has no other choice, let me explain the facts. He is for a Republican, an average governor. Okay, now this is, Trump is about to unleash one of the dumber attacks on DeSantis that you can, I mean, so far all of his attacks on DeSantis, frankly, have been quite stupid. His attacks on DeSantis have been that he's a George Soros plant. I'm sorry, that's just silly. It's silly on its face. It's ridiculous. George Soros is a wild leftist. Who's, by the way, you want to talk about Soros plants? How about the guy who's trying to prosecute you in New York, Mr. President? How about that guy? That guy's an actual Soros plant, meaning that Soros actually backed him with his money. Pretending that Ron DeSantis is backed by, by George Soros is absurd. It's absurd. Okay, but he says he is for, uh, by the way, his, his other accusations so far have also been repeating a crap story that is entirely debunked about Ron DeSantis hitting on high school students back when he was like a 23-year-old high school teacher. And then implying without any evidence whatsoever that maybe he was hitting on males. So far, that has been the extent of Donald Trump's attacks on Ron DeSantis. Now, he's going to get into just down the line. I mean, these attacks are so bad that Nikki Freed, who's the head of the Florida Democratic Party, was retweeting Donald Trump and saying, oh, it's all true. Nikki Freed's a moron. Not only is she a moron, she's a corrupt moron. And yet she and Donald Trump are on the same page. That's not a great time. So Trump said, DeSantis is for a Republican, an average governor. He got 1.2 million less votes in Florida than me. Oh, you mean that that typically gubernatorial candidates get less get get fewer votes than than actual presidential candidates? Well, yeah, I mean, like in an off year, an off election year. I noticed that 2022 was an off election year. He said he fought for massive cuts in Social Security and Medicare. Well, no, actually, that's not what he did. He wanted Social Security minimum age to be raised to 70 years old or more. So these are all left wing attacks on DeSantis. 
right? Because everyone knows, by the way, that Social Security is bankrupt and that there will have to be changes to it. He's not talking about his congressional record. By the way, Donald Trump was negotiating with Paul Ryan. It was Donald Trump who backed Paul Ryan for the speakership, lest we forget. Donald Trump was not a, an anti-Paul Ryan guy. He became an anti-Paul Ryan guy when it became convenient to become an anti-Paul Ryan guy. So that's why he says he's a disciple of Paul Ryan and did whatever Ryan told him to do. So what are all those pictures of Don President Donald Trump signing bills next to Paul Ryan? Florida has been successful for many years, long before I put Ron there. It's amazing what ocean and sunshine will do, says Donald Trump. Surprise, Ron was a big lockdown governor on the China virus. Like, I'm sorry, this dog ain't gonna hunt. Ron was a big lockdown governor? You were chiding Brian Kemp for reopening Georgia in the middle of the pandemic, dude. You made Anthony Fauci a thing. You made Anthony Fauci famous and you kept him in place. Sealing all beaches and everything else for an extended period of time. No, by, by late April, he was already unlocking all that stuff and overriding counties in doing so. Was third worst in the nation for COVID-19 deaths, supposedly. Third worst for total number of cases. Other Republican governors did much better than Ron. And because I allowed them this freedom, never closed their states. Okay, I'm going to need him to uh, name names. And who are the Republicans who, quote unquote, never closed their states? And, and this notion that Donald Trump never closed anything. Anthony Fauci was a Donald Trump elevation. Deborah Burks is in the news because Donald Trump elevated her to a position of public. I'm, I'm sorry, the, the, pretending that he's an outsider is absurd. He's not an outsider. He was the president during all of this. Remember, I left that decision up to the governor, says, says Donald Trump. For COVID death rates per state, Ron, as governor of Florida, did worse than New York. No, he didn't. No, he did not. That is a lie. It's a lie because you have to age adjust all that stuff. Florida's a super old state. In education, Florida ranks among the worst in the country. On crime statistics, Florida ranked third worst in murder, third worst in rape, third worst in aggravated assault. For 2022, Jacksonville ranked as one of the top 25 major crime cities in the country, with Tampa and Orlando not doing much better. On education, Florida ranks number 39 in health and safety in the country, number 50 in affordability, number 30 in education and child care. Hardly greatness there. The fact is, Ron is an average governor, but the best by far in the country in one category, public relations, where he easily ranks number one. But it is all a mirage. Just look at the facts and figures. They don't lie. And we don't want Ron as our president. So Donald Trump taking the opportunity of being almost indicted to apparently attack a fellow Republican. Guys, if this is the strategy that you choose to win an election, uh, good luck to Republicans. Seriously, good luck. Democrats, of course, are immediately jumping on this train, enjoying it. By the way, none of this is right. Florida is middle of the pack on affordability, as Giancarlo Sopo points out correctly. Florida ranks third in education. Florida's age-adjusted COVID death rate per capita is below the national average. Florida's gun deaths per capita are below the national average. Florida currently has a 50-year low in its crime rate. Florida had insurance spikes because it had the third costliest hurricane in history in 2022. And so, again, Trump is just putting out a bunch of garbage. And I guess if this is what you want, this is what you're going to get. And this, this very irritating notion that Donald Trump can basically run this election by hitting people in the back of the head with a hammer randomly, and everybody else is supposed to just never engage. And that if you do engage, it's a sign of disloyalty to the party. If Trump is the party, he's going to win the nomination. That's going to be it. I mean, that's all. If, if, this, if this nomination process turns into a loyalty test about Donald Trump, of course Trump is going to win the nomination. Of course he is. But if Republicans are going to think about who they believe is most likely to win the 2024 presidential race, not who they are most sympathetic to because he's being attacked wrongfully, I agree with that. But if they are talking about who is most likely to win a presidential race, question, is it the guy who is likely to be under even false charges of indictment? Even not, is it the guy who's likely to be embroiled in 2020 issues and legal battles from 2006? And the person who is just kind of ranting and spewing stuff into the ether on Truth Social? Or is the person who's meticulously attacking Joe Biden on an issue by issue basis? By the way, we already have some answers to this question because in 2022, Ron DeSantis is great in Florida. He won independence by 18%. In 2020, we already had Donald Trump run against Joe Biden and he didn't do amazing, guys. He just didn't. Okay, in just one second, we'll get to the situation with the Federal Reserve, which is likely to sink. The Again, the, the opportunities for Republicans here in terms of electoral opportunities are nearly endless, but never... You know, Republicans apparently never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Okay, first, many of us have lost faith in the government, media, and the schools. The good news is there is something you can do to help get the country back on track. PragerU is an educational nonprofit that is fighting with us to save the future of the country. Daily Wire is basically sister companies with PragerU. We've worked with them for a very, very long time. Dennis Prager is a good friend of mine, good friend of Jeremy Borings. I've known Dennis for pretty much my whole life, actually. PragerU is doing amazing work. They're watched 5 million times a day. Their videos spread messages of liberty, economic freedom, and Judeo-Christian values to the next generation. There truly is hope for America, but only if we reach more young people. PragerU does need your help today. Head on over to PragerU.com. 
Make a tax-deductible donation. Whatever you give right now will be matched and have triple the impact. If you donate 10 bucks, it becomes 30. You give 50 bucks, wait for it, it becomes 150. Yes, you can still do those basic calculations because probably you went to PragerU. You get the idea. Go to PragerU.com, make a tax-deductible donation. Whatever you give will be tripled. They're doing amazing work. I've done a bunch of videos myself for PragerU. They're doing just tremendous stuff, accessing the minds of people who need to have their minds opened every single day. Go to PragerU.com, make your tax-deductible donation today. And once again, whatever you give, will be tripled. Also, a lot of people would say science and religion are not linked. If you paid attention to history, however, you would know that this is a lie. Science and religion are, in fact, deeply linked. Watch Jordan Peterson explain how the pursuit of science began in religious institutions in his special, Logos and Literacy. Well, one thing that's quite striking about modern rational culture is this insistence that the religious tradition of the West and the scientific tradition are somehow at fundamental odds. I mean, I, I used to believe that, I think, when I was young, at least to some degree. And although now I'm very curious about where that idea came from, because it's absolutely clear, first of all, that the universities themselves emerged out of the monasteries. That's just completely unquestionable. Oxford and Cambridge are monasteries for all intents and purposes. And so the whole university idea emerged out of the church. And then the notion that the universe is in fact intelligible and that the pursuit of truth would be redemptive, that's a fundamentally religious idea. And then the scientific endeavor itself, given figures like Newton, for example, was embedded inside that religious tradition. Jordan is bringing unparalleled wisdom to a lot of people. Now, this is the part where I'd normally tell you Logos and Literacy is only available for Daily Wire Plus members. We are making it available for free for everyone right now at dailywireplus.com, only for a limited time. So watch Logos and Literacy today at dailywireplus.com. Well, meanwhile, the Federal Reserve caught between a rock and a hard place. They decided yesterday to attempt to walk that tightrope between inflation and bank turmoil by gradually raising those interest rates. They're raising them again, 25 basis points. Now, again, the, the reason that they're not raising it more than that is not because they think inflation is going away, but it's because they believe that if they raise it more than that, it will reverse the sense that inflation is going away. People will panic. There will be a problem in the stock market. They're also signaling they might taper out completely, that they're afraid that if they continue to raise those interest rates, it's going to sink the bond markets. If it sinks the bond markets, then a bunch of banks that have been buying bonds for the past several years are going to see their asset base decrease. They won't be able to go liquid in case there's a run on the bank. Right? This is the untold story of SVB. Right? The reason that Silicon Valley Bank essentially went bankrupt is because there's a run on the bank at the same time they couldn't liquidate their assets because all of their bond holdings had been decreased in value by the increase in subsequent interest rates. And that's in one sentence, essentially what happened with SVB. It's going to happen with a lot of institutions if the interest rates keep going up in order to fight inflation. But if the Federal Reserve allows inflation to keep going up, the economy is going to continue to tank. So the Federal Reserve took that middle road yesterday. According to the Wall Street Journal, the Fed recognized that something was breaking. Recent data had pointed to economic growth accelerating and underlying inflation remaining stubbornly high. Fed Chairman Jerome Powell indicated to Congress earlier this month that trends likely would require rates to rise above 5.25%, perhaps by a lot. The projections released on Wednesday show that Powell and his colleagues have abandoned those plans. Now they say that they think that the target range is going to end up at 5 to 5.25%. So they are tapering out, but they're tapering out too early, which means inflation is now going to be endemic, which is one of the reasons why you're seeing the stock market begin to tumble a little bit. Right? The, the, as MarketWatch points out, the yield curve inversion has likely peaked, which is usually bad news for stocks. Right? People are going to start investing presumably in bonds again, thinking that the inflation, the, the interest rates are not going to go up any further, which means that stock market is going to go down. Money is going to be a lot more expensive. And so, you know, again, they created this mess for themselves. They're stuck between a rock and a hard place. They really need to raise those interest rates higher in order to quash the inflation. The inflation is going to remain stubbornly high. The, inf the interest rates are going to remain stubbornly high. But if they go any higher, then they're really undercutting themselves. Here's Jay Powell yesterday at the Federal Reserve announcing that 25 basis point increase. We are highly attentive to the risks that high inflation poses to both sides of our mandate, and we are strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2% objective. At today's meeting, the committee raised the target range for the federal funds rate by a quarter percentage point, bringing the target range to four and three quarters to 5%. Now, Powell was trying to make clear to everybody that more spending isn't going to hurt the problem. But more spending, of course, is going to be a real problem. He said runaway spending is not driving the story on inflation, which is weird because it seems like runaway spending is entirely driving the story on inflation, or at least in large part. The spending that's happened is working against what you are doing, right? So it's prolonging inflation. You know, if you, you have to look at, um, at the impulse from spending because spending was, of course, tremendously high during the pandemic. And then as the pandemic programs uh, rolled off, spending actually came down. So the, 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 the sort of fiscal impulse is actually 
not what's driving inflation right now. It was it was at the beginning, perhaps part of what was driving inflation, but that's not really the story now. Okay, but the the, the decrease in the in the funding has still retained a level of of funding that is extraordinarily high. And when you inject extraordinary liquidity into the system by basically backstopping all FDIC deposits, and not only FDIC deposits but unsecured deposits, well, that, that that's a whole bag of liquidity that you're injecting into the system. Now he says. Quote, we're looking at what's happening among the banks and asking, is there going to be some tightening in credit conditions in a way that substitutes for rate hikes? But why would there be a tightening in credit conditions when you're explicitly saying that you're going to backstop any bank that goes bankrupt? It's, this, this is, it's foolish. So you're going to end up with this lukewarm policy that is neither going to quash inflation, nor is it going to actually prevent the impacts of a higher interest rate. It's sort of the worst of both worlds. Meanwhile, again, you have all of these federal appointees, people like Janet Yellen over at the Treasury Department, who refuses to acknowledge that if we just keep spending money, it's a problem. What, what debt as a percentage of our GDP is too much? So it depends on what interest rates are. And real interest rates have been extremely low. The, this budget and previous budgets have projected that they would move up toward more normal levels over time, but certainly not the levels that we saw several decades ago. And Could you just answer my judged. question, Madam Secretary? What percentage of, of, what percentage of our G, uh, uh, debt of our GDP is too much? Well, this budget has um, debt held by the public moving up to around 109% of GDP. And that's not too much, in your opinion. And she says, not, not really. I mean, not, not really is her answer. Because there is no answer. And the bottom line is that all the same people who brought you 40-year inflation are still in power. And by the way, they're angry that the interest rates are increasing. So Elizabeth Warren, after suggesting that money is free, right? She bought into the modern monetary theory lie that you can just continue to blow out the debt with no consequences whatsoever, that spending will never have any impact and inflation will never hit home. Now she's calling for Jerome Powell's ouster, not because he's been too loose with the money, but because he's too tight with the money by increasing those interest rates. Here's Elizabeth Warren, who's been wrong on every single topic for the last several years. Have you ever directly told President Biden that you think he should fire uh, the chair, fire Jerome Powell? And who would you like to see replace him? So I'm not going to talk about private conversations. Uh, but what I will say is I've made it very clear as publicly as humanly possible that I didn't think that he should be reconfirmed as president, as chair of the Fed. And I think he's doing a really terrible job. Okay, why does she think that he's doing a really terrible job? Because, of course, he's being too hawkish, according to Elizabeth Warren. And this is going to be the, the going take among Democrats, is that if the economy goes down, it's because the Federal Reserve got too hawkish. They should have continued the inflationary policy. By the way, they used to say this pretty openly. And Ezra Klein once said that one of the sad things about the inflation spiral is that it was killing his dream of basically inflating the economy at the bottom rungs. He said that was supposed to be part of the plan. Meanwhile, the Biden administration trying to walk its way through the dark here. Karine Jean-Pierre, world's worst press secretary, she says, guys, don't worry. The economy is super strong because of Joe Biden. On the economy, does the president still have the same level of confidence that he's had that the U.S. will get through this banking crisis, <laughs> get through this high inflation without going into a recession? Look, the president uh, has complete confidence uh, in, in, in the process, in his, in his uh, economic uh, policy, if you think about it. When we, look at, um, when we look at how strong the economy is, it's because of the president's work, what he's been able to do, building an economy from the bottom up, middle out. Bottom up, middle out. Again, and they just keep repeating the nostrums, man. Just keep repeating it. Meanwhile, Joe Biden continues his wild incompetence. The man cannot speak English yesterday. Again, Joe Biden versus the teleprompter, latest episode. Yesterday, he, uh, he um, tried to talk about Jill Biden. It went very, very poorly. Fight. Fight. <laughs> True international depression. This is a time for celebrating extraordinary women who have made their mark in history, strengthen our nation. And like Jill, the first lady, the first full-time lady, the first lady who works full-time, <laughs> in addition to being the first lady, as a professor. Where we're all just laughing at the old man now. By the way, he, he also told a weird story about how Jill puts messages on his mirror while he is shaving. So first of all, congratulations to the president of the United States on, on being able to shave himself. That's, a, that's, exci that's an exciting new development in his life. Second of all, 
they're weird messages. We were talking inside. Jill has, and I think I told Nancy this before, Jill has put some messages on my mirror while I'm shaving, so I make sure I see them. <laughs> and one that was put in about a year ago was, stop trying to make me love you. I don't even know what that means. Is that like, leave me alone, old man? Stop trying to make me love you. I have a feeling the messages are more like, your name is Joe Biden and you are president of the United States. <laughs> on the mirror every morning, to make sure that he still knows. Well, meanwhile, we are told by the media that Joe Biden is doing an excellent job. His approval rating has started to rise. We talked about it yesterday. Well, now it's dipping again. He's back down to 38%. This is a target-rich environment for Republicans. Look at his administration. It's a disaster area. Yesterday, Xavier Becerra, who is the head of the Health and Human Services Department, he admitted that he literally has no idea how many HHS employees actually even go to work. That's an amazing thing. Should, you're the head of a major American department. Shouldn't you know how many people, like what percentage go to work on a daily basis? Like at all? Can you give a breakdown of how many full-time employees are at their desk in one of these buildings every day? Senator, when you, um, when you take a look at the workforce at HHS, and we're close to 90,000 throughout the country, um, and working in various parts of the country, uh, some here in headquarters. By the way, headquarters, we have an underground. I, I got limited time, so, so this may be misleading. So tell me, of what percent of the employees are at their desk, full-time employees are at the desk on any given day? And I don't mean to be rude, it's just so limited time. No, and I, I appreciate that. And our, our folks are working full-time. No, but how many are at their desk as opposed to being at home or well, someplace else, a coffee we, shop or whatever? Yeah, we, what we make sure, sure we care about is that they're performing and they're delivering, and that's why— Well, that's not really answering my question. Well, not only is it not answering the question, they're not performing and delivering. According to the New York Times, the vast breach of the American southern border by illegal immigrants and the bringing across of small children via smugglers, the HHS is, is, is actually designated the task of following up on kids who are released to adults. So under the current law, kids can be released to adult caretakers once they get over the borders, so they're not being held in custody. But according to the New York Times, as more and more children have arrived, the Biden White House has ramped up demands on staffers to move children quickly out of shelters and release them to adults. Caseworkers say they rush through vetting sponsors. While HHS checks on all minors by calling them a month after they begin living with their sponsors, data obtained by the time showed that over the last two years alone, the agency could not reach more than 85,000 children. The HHS literally lost 85,000 child migrants. Overall, the agency lost immediate contact with one third of migrant children. Great job protecting the kiddos right there. Just really solid job there. Xavier Becerra was asked about this. He's like, I don't know. Probably all the people working from coffee shops are doing an amazing idea, uh, are doing an amazing job. Every week, I get briefed by my team sometimes two or three times a week on this situation uh, with the unaccompanied migrant kids and where we stand. I've never heard that number of 85,000. I don't know where it comes from. Okay. And uh, so I can't attest. I, I, I would say I, it doesn't sound at all to be realistic. And what we do is we try to follow up as best we can with these kids. Uh, Congress has given us certain authorities. Our authorities essentially end the moment we have found a, a suitable sponsor to place that child with. We try to do some follow-up, but neither the child or the sponsor is actually obligated to follow up with us. And Oh, okay. Well, um, you know where the number came from is the New York Times. So that, that, that's where it came from. Again, they're doing an amazing job over there. Meanwhile, the State Department also doing an extraordinary job handing over the Middle East to China, not really facilitating any sort of serious discussion in Ukraine. They're just doing an incredible job. The good news is that the State Department is, in fact, being modernized because they are now including diversity, equity, and inclusion. This follows hard on John Car Kirby explaining yesterday that LGBTQIA plus minus divided by sign issues are the tip of America's foreign policy spear. Here is a Tony Blinken explaining that the State Department is being modernized by injecting equity principles. The budget will advance our efforts to modernize the State Department, including by expanding our training float, uh, updating our technology, carrying out diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility initiatives, including to make our overseas missions more accessible. I'm grateful for the progress we've already made together, including Congress's support in updating the Secure Embassy Construction and Counterterrorism Act and Accountability Review Board to give us some of the flexibility that we need to open new missions and better manage the risks that we face. Oh. 
Great. I'm, I'm so glad that we're doing all those things while the world enters into meltdown mode. It's, it's all going amazing. But I think the most important news of the day, however, is that Merrick Garland, our current attorney general, when he's not targeting the police departments across the country and or school parents, uh, he is also a huge Taylor Swift fan, according to the Wall Street Journal. That is, that is really exciting. Apparently, at a congressional hearing on Wednesday, senators grilled Merrick Garland on the DOJ's investigation into Ticketmaster. And uh, Garland started just name dropping titles of Taylor Swift songs because there's nothing quite as charming as a man of Merrick Garland's age and uh, reputation. He is approximately uh, 70 years old, citing Taylor Swift songs. He's, he's in with the kiddies, is, is Merrick Garland. Just exciting stuff from our, our nation's best. Okay, time for some things I like and then some things that I hate. So things that I like today. So Anna Kasparian, of course, has been a guest on the Sunday special. And she is, you know, she and I disagree on a lot, but she is rational enough to recognize when the insane woke left has gone too far so Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, the other day, she literally referred to, to women as people who menstruate. And Anna tweeted out, I'm a woman. Please don't ever refer to me as a person with a uterus, birthing person, or a person who menstruates. How do people not realize how degrading this is? You can support the transgender community without doing this bleep. Naturally, the world caved in on her. She's not allowed to say that. You know, being a woman and all, she's not allowed to point that out. And so this drove tweets like this one from Alejandra Caraballo, who is in fact a biological man, saying, quote, Oh, F off with this stupid made up BS. Trans folks are having their existence criminalized in state after state. And you want to whine about this bleep? Well, that seems like a lot of male aggression there being taken out by Alejandra Caraballo on, uh, on Anna Kasparian. Again, you must not go against the Borg. Good for Anna for saying the truth. And uh, and I I'm pleased that you know, Anna has, has done this a few times. She on my show talk about the, the fact that the homelessness crisis in California is very real. The crime crisis in California is very real and that it is not anti-liberal or even anti-leftist to point that out. And she's been ripped up and down by the left for doing all of that now for the simple fact that she has said that women exist and that they are not, in fact, just birthing persons or persons with uteruses. And uh, now she's getting ripped up and down by the left. Good, good for Anna for taking the incoming on that. By the way, you know, one quick point here. There's an argument made by people like AOC. Like, well, you know, you say you say that women, biological women exist. But I tell you that there are certain that you say that men can't give birth. Well, there are certain women who can't give birth. There's a commentator online who made an excellent point about this. When you tell a biological woman that she cannot give birth, this is the most devastating day of her life for the vast majority of women who hear that. And they tell her that she's infertile. That is a devastating day. When you tell a man that he's infertile, that's called a normal day. Because men, in terms of, in terms of not being able to bear children, that is perfectly obvious to everyone. There is a difference in kind. Okay, this leads us to some things that I hate. So the movement to trans the children continues apace. Billy Porter, who has apparently become a celebrity for some reason that I honestly cannot define or, or explain. I do not know why this is a famous person. He does not seem supremely talented to me. I've never seen him in anything where I thought, man, that, that guy is good at things. Um, but he was on The View and uh, dressed like a lady, because this is what Billy Porter does in order to break barriers and, and such. And in the middle of this, he started ranting about how children need to be exposed to drag queens. It's very important for children to be exposed to the drag queens. So uh, here he was explaining this on The View. Florida Governor uh, DeSantis uh, had just filed a complaint against a bar called the R House yeah. that holds drag shows. Okay? Yeah. Uh, eight months later, things have only escalated. As we talk about it, you know, it's constant um, aggravation with this. What do you make of the fact that we're still talking about this? You know, we've Why all, are they doing it? I, th for power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everything is about power, and you could always trace it back to the money. You say that all the time. Yeah. Follow you know, the money. It's, it's follow the money, follow the power, power at any cost. It's very hypocritical. You know, the, the, <coughs> the leading cause of death in children are guns. Yeah. 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 They're guns. Yeah. We're going to the John Stewart nonsense here. It's guns. It's guns. Okay, so I, I just have a question. Even let's assume that you were right on gun control, which you're not. Let's assume that's the case. Why does that justify exposing small children to drag? Why? 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 What is the great necessity? What is the great cultural necessity to exposing small children to men dressed as women in dancing in sexualized fashion? Why? Why is that? Why is that so exciting to you? Why is this such a priority to you? And I'm, I'm getting very, very tired of people making this a priority. And then when we notice and we say no, you say, well, why are you even noticing? Why is this even an issue to you? Guns! Okay. How about this? How about if you want to have the guns conversation? 
And the defense conversation, we have that conversation. And then we also have a conversation about why it seems so important to a bunch of grown ass men to expose themselves to small children. Why does that seem so important to you? Why is it so important that you expose cross-dressing to kids? I have a feeling it has nothing to do with the kids and everything to do with you. It also has to do with a class of parents who are much more interested in the clicks and giggles of a bunch of morons online than they are in the well-being of their own children in order to facilitate this. So one of those people is apparently Marin Morris. So I will admit to not knowing who Marin Morris was, but Marin Morris is apparently some sort of country singer. And uh, she was doing a speech at an LGBTQ plus minus divided by sign, happy face emoji, sad face emoji, poop emoji festival. And she explained that she had brought her toddler to meet a bunch of drag queens. And this makes her a virtuous person. See, normally you would think that it's your job to protect the innocence of your children wrong. It is your job to expose your children to men in sexualized garb dressed as women. Very, very important. Makes you a good, good parent. It's for the good of the children. Now you can't explain how it is for the good of the children without also presumably having to explain that gender fluidity is good for kids, that lack of standards is good for kids, that confusion is good for kids. Now, you can't explain any of that in rational fashion, so it's just a cult. But here she is explaining, you know, if I'm in Tennessee and they're going to prosecute me, well, then go for it. Go for it. First of all, that's not what Tennessee law says. What it says, Tennessee law and Florida law and laws that are like it say that the person who is exposing drag, the, the people who are performing the drag shows for the children are the ones who would be prosecutable, not the parents. But put that aside. Here she is, virtue signaling. And, and then and then when the kid gets screwed up, it'll be like, oh, well, how did this happen? Must be genetics. Must be, it's just the genes. And yes, I introduced my son to some drag queens today. So Tennessee, f-ing arrest me. Oh, such heroism. You introduced your two-year-old son to a bunch of drag queens. Ah, well, and, and of course, you're looking for the cheers. That's why you say this. And apparently this woman said, quote, I brought my son here earlier today for sound check. He's turning three this week. We got to go in the room where all the queens were getting ready and doing their makeup. He freaked out when he went in there because it's just magic what the drag queens do. There's wigs everywhere. The smell of hairspray and wig glue. There's glitter. Everyone's in a good mood. It's just a room of love. We went back to my dressing room. And my son is like, I need the queens. I'm like, you're looking at her, the singer said. Ah, so much, just the, the heroism. I have a question. Where's dad? Where's dad? Seriously. I, I don't know how any father would allow this to happen to their child, but, um, that, that is some terrible parenting as per our usual arrangement. The good news, however, is that the, the wages of this sort of silliness are being felt all over the country. So apparently, a trans athlete, 46, just won the women's New York City cycling race and says she feels like a superhero. Isn't that exciting stuff? Tiffany Thomas, 46, was born male, ended the Randall's Island crit cycling race atop the podium, blowing the competition out of the water to snatch first place. Despite only taking up cycling in 2018, Tiffany quickly found success and has dominated competitions in the years since. She recently landed a place on top cycling team, LA Sweat, where her oldest teammate is just 32 years old. You mean the giant man won? No, no, that's shocking. Wow. Men are so good at being women that they they race for like five five seconds and they're beating all the women. Just incredible. The good news is, of course, that Pentagon doctors are in agreement with all of this, according to Fox News. Health providers at U.S. military bases blasted the idea of waiting before injecting kids diagnosed with gender dysphoria with puberty blockers and hormones. The DOD provider said in the March edition of the American Journal of Public Health, the only pathway for children of military members who present with gender dysphoria is to immediately move toward gender-affirming health care, such as puberty suppression and affirming hormones. This is coming from the health providers of U.S. military bases. So the entire vertically integrated system of propagandistic nonsense is on the march. But you're not allowed to notice. You're not allowed to notice. Everything is, everything is perfectly fine. And our society is in perfectly good shape. Probably we should focus in on Ron DeSantis or something. All right, guys, the rest of the show is continuing right now. You're not going to want to miss it. We'll be taking your phone calls. If you're not a member, become a member. Use code Shapiro. Check out for two months free on all annual plans. Click the link in the description and join us.